Hello, I am Edward Braham and I'm the Chair and Senior Partner of Freshfields. And it's my privilege to introduce the Wilkins brothers. David and Tim are in fact the third generation of distinguished lawyers in their family. Two generations went to Harvard Law School. Their father, Julian, was the first black partner of a major Chicago law firm. And their uncle, John, was the first black professor at the University of Berkeley. Remarkably, this is the first time that they've done an event in public together. David is a professor at Harvard Law School. I first met him on the executive leadership course that he co-founded. He was articulate and challenging as always, but it was his passion for diversity that shone through. Tim is a partner of Freshfields. He's worked in Tokyo and New York. And a few years ago, I persuaded him to become the first global partner for client sustainability. I'd like to talk a little about the journey towards sustainability. It's not very long ago, and we were talking about CSR, with its focus on volunteering, on charity, and sometimes philanthropy. Five years ago, I launched our own responsible business programme, which brought together under one umbrella integrity and ethics, environment, community investment, pro bono, and perhaps most importantly, culture and diversity. Sustainability takes this a step further. And in my mind, is based on the notion that business needs to be seen to make a net positive contribution to society over time. It cannot be a permanent drain. If you think about some of the sudden shifts that we've experienced, things like the collapse of the whaling industry in the 19th century, or the behavioural changes expected of business when regulators got serious about enforcing the legislation against fraud, bribery and cartels, or indeed the shift to renewables now. These are things you want to be thinking ahead about because they're events that require rapid organisational change and you can't make that sort of change overnight. What you also can't anticipate is exactly when the tipping point will come which means you have to make that change. I think that diversity, especially racial justice and equality, are now at or beyond a critical tipping point. As lawyers, we are in the middle of things. We have our own firms to run. We want to attract talented people. We want to develop them, retain them. And when they leave us, we want them to speak highly about us. Our clients are demanding change of us. And in our turn, we can and must demand change of those who supply us. And of course, we're also advisors. We're advising boards on their obligations. We're helping clients anticipate future change and we're helping them develop their own systems and processes. And we support them in their transactions, their litigation and their risk management. With racial justice and equality at the heart of the sustainability agenda, and businesses across the world facing a need to change rapidly. We are indeed privileged to have David and Tim to lead us through the issues. Thank you very much, Edward, for those kind words. Hi, David. See you over there. We have over a thousand people who are joining us uh, today across the globe. Um, Edward, just a personal thank you for our 20 years of friendship and the last five years of you at the head of our firm. A sincere thank you for that. Um, and it is a real privilege to be speaking um, today during October, which is UK Black History Month. So uh, hello to all of our friends in London, Manchester, and across the UK as we celebrate this month. I wanna also say thank you to the great team at Freshfields and David at the Harvard Law School Center for the Legal Profession for all of your help in creating the content for this webinar, as well as the production, which we all hope from a tech point of view goes very well. Um, but, you know, one of the big pieces for this, David, of course, is that, uh, we are not the first Wilkins brothers uh, to come out of Harvard Law School. We uh, want to dedicate this webinar to our Uncle John and our father Julian, who were pioneers both as professors 
and practitioners just kind of like the two of us. Um, and of course, we want to uh, say a special thank you to Carolyn and Stephen, our other siblings, and mom who's watching from home in Chicago. So David, can you set the stage for us about what we're going to cover and kick us off? Thank you, Tim. Uh, this really is a thrill. Uh, thank you, Edward. Uh, I'll just say, uh, as a student, you did well. Uh, very proud of what you've uh, done. He was just a mere corporate partner when I first met him. Uh, and in addition to it being uh, Black History Month in the UK, it's also the month of our father's birthday, actually, which would have been October 5th. So uh, we're very honored to be here together. Uh, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what we're going to do, and then we're going to dive right in. So I'm going to try to set the stage a little bit by saying from a kind of academic point of view, which is what I do, what is happening at the current moment. Uh, then I'm going to hand it over to my brother, Tim, who's going to talk more specifically around the intersection of sustainability and social justice and where that is today. Uh, then he's going to kick it back to me. Uh, and I'm going to focus a little bit more specifically about what's happening around these issues in the legal profession. Again, trying to put that in some historical context and where we are moving forward. And finally, Tim will talk uh, about what the best practices can and should be uh, to take us through this moment to the kind of transformation that Edward talked about. So let me get started. I'm just going to share my screen here. I've become something of a Zoom maven. So let's hope I can actually do this well. Um, and the, I kind of titled this Reimagining Lawyering in a World on Fire. It comes from the title of a very important new book by a Harvard University professor named Rebecca Henderson. She's actually a university professor, the highest professor we have. And uh, Professor Henderson argues that this is a moment where we need to reimagine how we think about the world. Um, and so just to kind of locate us of where we are, you know, as the Chinese would say, uh, we are living in interesting times because there's not just one crisis going on, we're in the midst of three related crises that I think we all know what they are, a global health crisis, a looming global economic crisis, and an increasingly global call for social and racial justice. And all three of these crises collectively have exposed deep structural challenges that will last far longer the current sense of emergency is and all three of these have major implications for the legal profession. And yet, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that although these times are unprecedented in many ways, they also have precedents that we should be thinking about. So even before 2020, which will go down as a year in history, I'm ready for it to be over, quite frankly, there were three big trends that were reshaping the market for legal services. And again, you all know what they are. Globalization of economic activity and the incredible shift of that activity from the traditional centers of the global north and west to the global south and east. It doesn't mean that the UK or the US are unimportant, but nobody can doubt the important shift that has been taking place. The second is the incredible rise in the speed and the sophistication of information technology. And finally, this is a little academic sounding, uh, but I'm an academic, so I get paid to talk this way. What I call the blurring together of traditional categories of organization and thought, it's just a fancy way of saying things that we used to think of as being all separate and distinct are much more connected and intertwined than they ever were before. Um, these changes have already restructured markets in very important ways. So first, there's been a huge reduction in what the economists would call information asymmetry between buyers and sellers. Again, just another fancy way of saying buyers are way more sophisticated about what they want, when they want it, how they want it, and are saying to the sellers to take things that the seller had all bundled together for the benefit of the seller and to unbundle them and rearrange them across increasingly global supply chains. This in turn has changed the idea of competition, where we used to think of 
you know, things like reputation and credentials as the most important assets, particularly in a field like law, we're increasingly being pushed to think about value as measured by metrics that are important to our clients and the consumers of legal services. And finally, we don't think about just a sole firm producing everything. More and more of what we do uh, is the product of networks and platforms. These things have been restructuring the entire global economy long before the current moment. And they have created a whole raft of new problems for business clients. Again, even before COVID, when I would ask general counsels, as I often did, what keeps you up at night? They'd say things like cybersecurity and data privacy, anti-bribery and corruption, safety and catastrophic risk. All of these things are characterized by an exploding amount of new law around the world. You know, almost none of it clear or consistent. And yet, this is the key thing, law is only a part and from our client's perspective, not the most important part about solving these problems. And therefore, clients are looking to us, the legal profession, to integrate law into a wider business solution. And this demand is only going to increase uh, in the world after COVID. Right? Consider all of the new kinds of legal work that the COVID crisis is new laws, programs, redesigned institutions from the PPP program here to contact tracing to online courts, new corporate possibility, uh, uh, policies and practices or revisited ones around employment, online work, supply chains, data privacy and security, a whole raft of reorganizations through bankruptcy and restructuring or strategic acquisitions, new kinds of public-private partnerships in healthcare, pharmaceuticals, education, and on a global scale, global compacts, indicators, mandates from the UN to the modern slavery laws in the UK and California. In all of these areas, clients need lawyers who understand the new demands of corporate governance and accountability that Edward talked about. Look, it wasn't so long ago that everyone would cite this famous maxim from Milton Friedman, you know, the social responsibility of businesses to increase profits, period, the end. Even before COVID, this was being dramatically upended. In 2018, most of you know, BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager, declared that it could look beyond the bottom line to invest in businesses that, quote, contribute to society, or the business roundtable here in my country, uh, followed up by amending its definition of the purpose of the corporation to include duties to all stakeholders, including customers, employees, and suppliers. Uh, and now we're moving, as Edward mentioned, from sustainability to social justice, or sustainability and social justice. So in January of this year, before the pandemic was serious, Black, or at least we knew it was serious, BlackRock issued a second letter that it would immediately stop investing in companies that present, quote, a high sustainability related risk. And by highlighting the structural inequality in everything from healthcare to employment, COVID is only going to accelerate these things. Any doubt about that? In July 2020, the World Economic Forum called for a, quote, great reset of capitalism in the wake of the pandemic. And after a summer of protests that spread from the US to the UK to Europe and increasingly around the world, it's now clear that racial and social justice must be a part of this broader sustainability agenda. Luckily, we have the smarter Wilkins brother who <laughs> can give us some insight about what's actually happening on the ground around these issues. So Tim, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you. Thank you, David. And I am going to start sharing my screen because I like very much how you've left us off. Let me see. I'm just going to see if I can get to the next slide. There we go. 
I really like how you have set us up beautifully to talk about the multi-stakeholders that are involved as we talk about this issue of how sustainability and social justice are coming together and intermingling. And the big point on this slide is it is a double-headed interaction now with corporate decision makers and advisors being influenced by investors, employees, communities, suppliers, and consumers. And nowhere was that more clear than when we looked at all of the corporate statements that were being made by um, the Fortune 100 companies right after the tragic killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. So we wanted to do some research on it to actually interrogate and look and see what those corporate statements were saying, how those five main stakeholders were influencing both back and forth and see, can this give us a possibility that we're going to really see progress on racial and social justice? So. Starting with the good news, over half of the Fortune 100 companies immediately issued statements. And we see a large number there of almost $3 billion in donations to social and racial justice causes from many of the big names. Now let's look specifically at some of the big players. Well, you mentioned investors, and in particular, you mentioned Larry Fink who's the CEO of BlackRock. And uh, David, I like to refer to him as the $15 trillion elephant in the room because those letters that you cited about influencing where they're going to put those $15 trillion in investments are being heard by corporations. But it's not just the investor um, itself in terms of putting the pressure, but it's coming up with some new creative ideas. And here is where we're seeing a blend of the sustainability world where we've seen um, issuances of green bonds, for example, has been a great way to raise money to help on climate change related issues. Well, now Alphabet, who's the parent company of Google, just issued a record $5.75 billion green bond that they call their sustainability bond because it focuses on social issues. And in particular, it dedicates $175 million to investments in black owned businesses. And there's good reason for companies tapping the markets there because there is a big interest from investments in buying these type of sustainability bonds. And also the big investors appreciate very clearly that those companies that they invest in that have this type of sustainability track record, which we're going to include also around racial justice, are performing really well. And in fact, during the pandemic, they've outperformed other companies because of the stability they had, you mentioned around supply chains, but also the stability they had of loyalty of customers as well as their own employers. So now you have the legal and generals of the world, which is a large investment firm that said, if we don't see um, a director um, on a FTSE 100 company um, or an S&P 500 company that doesn't have at least just one black, Asian or other minority director, we're not going to vote for those directors. And they're going to institute that by January 1, 2022. So one year to get that in place. Um, and regulation is coming. As you were mentioning, David, on regulation on some of the broader sustainability themes, specifically around racial justice and representation in the US, California, Governor Newsom has signed into law requiring publicly traded corporations to appoint directors from underrepresented communities. And in Canada, they have one where they say there must be a disclosure about what the type of representation is around quote unquote visible minorities, which of course will also include indigenous people. So let's turn to stakeholder two. We know companies always respond to their consumers. And David, I like how you're describing the trend 
related to younger generations coming up, their power. And look at these numbers on buying power. You know, millennials, $1.4 trillion of buying power. Gen Z, in which I have a son who belongs to, are graduating from college this year, and they will be having a huge amount of buying power, already $143 billion. And then black Americans, it's predicted by 2023, will have $1.5 trillion. So there's huge buying power, but there's also new consumers. And I think it's important to emphasize this origin story of products and goods make a difference to the new consumer. So we had always seen this in the sustainability space where having green products, making sure that in the supply chain, you don't use child labor to produce those products is important. But there's also the origin story of, are these businesses having senior black and other minority representation in their own leadership ranks? And also, are the products being uh, manufactured by Black-owned businesses, creating real wealth in the Black community or other communities of color? Um, but suppliers is also the third stakeholder, an important one. And we know that as much as that $3 billion number seems quite large, it is dwarf compared to the amount of average spend of companies on their procurement. And if there were policies that increased just the percentage, maybe two, 3% of the type of procurement of goods from black and minority owned businesses, you would see an exponential increase in a transfer of wealth to those communities. And Coca-Cola, for example, has taken the lead saying that over the next five years, they're gonna pledge to put $500 million into that supply chain um, to create more minority women business owned suppliers. But I also wanna talk about this macro trend we're seeing around localization. So David, you mentioned that there was this huge shock to the supply chains during the pandemic. And that's absolutely right that we now realize that vital goods like PPE, that they might've relied to come from far flung places in the world, now we're not being available because they were being used by their own nations to protect their own people. And so there became a localization and you're seeing uh, new initiatives like the New York Economic Development Corporation that quickly went into gear here in New York City to say, how can we build up local suppliers to manufacture PPE? And they had as a specific mandate that they would have a certain percentage being MWBE, Minority Women Black Enterprises, as part of that. And employees, we know there's always been a double-headed approach where there is, we're giving you a job, that's awfully nice from the companies, but there's a fight for talent. And David, the way that you describe the fact that this talent is a lot more mobile right now and quite aware of their own brands, that they will move to a different employer if they don't think that that employer is doing right by them. But we need to not be overly optimistic because one of the big concerns, my colleague Annette Byron and I wrote a piece specifically saying that there could be a lost generation of diverse talent because of this pandemic. The disparate impact on the educational opportunities for communities who aren't connected in what we're doing right now, this high tech world, were a real challenge. Not to mention all of the disparate health impacts that have people caring for people in their family. So there has to be a really proactive push on the employee side and the employees' voices will be heard. So we've seen walkouts, um, you know, uh, even an hour or two hour walkouts reverberate around in the tech world when they don't see social justice by their employer. Um, and I've got here on the slide, um, a great picture from a New York Times article on black LinkedIn. So LinkedIn, one of the most uh, well used, I think there's 790 million people on LinkedIn by the corporate world and black voices are now being heard and talking about the importance of how they're seeing opportunity in their workplace. 
and trying to influence changes in that workplace. Um, and then lastly, David, before I turn it back to you, of course, that community stakeholder piece is so important. And we saw this disparate impact and there was no doubt that for corporations, they appreciate that you cannot be um, a successful company if your community is suffering from a health point of view. The world was shut down because of the health issue. Um, and the world was reverberated and shut down by the calls for social justice. So you see on this slide, many examples of great initiatives by corporations that we saw in our research first on education, getting the pipeline right of having more blacks and people of color having the skills needed for the business world, um, including investments in historically black colleges and universities. We see on the health side, CVS um, has a $600 million pledge to improving the health in communities of color. And then David, many of our colleagues and friends from law school have also gone into specifically on the social justice side where large corporations appreciate their best chance is actually to fund those people out on the front line. The Brian Stevens at the Equal Justice Initiative or uh, Sharon Eiffel at NAACP Legal Defense Fund. So David, I'm gonna stop sharing here and let you talk specifically a bit more about the legal world and profession which you know best. <laughs> So thanks, Tim. Uh, I think it's a perfect transition because the question is, there's a lot going on out there. Now the question is, what we're, what are we doing here in the legal profession? So, you know, because I think it's very important for us as lawyers, uh, not just to follow, but to lead and to lead in our own house. So again, uh, there's a new normal here uh, that's being created. And that's not so easy for us because law is one of the most traditional professions there is. I often like to jokingly say, although it's actually not really a joke, that in the common law world, you cannot say anything new until you definitively prove somebody's already said it before. That's called precedent. But it's also called not exactly growth mindset, okay? <clears throat> but this traditional world has been, again, disrupted by all the same forces that I talked about earlier, globalization, technology, blurred, boundaries that are reshaping our clients. And these are in turn putting pressure on our traditional organizational model. So our business model, sorry, Edward, hourly billing driven by leverage, uh, or our human cap capital model, which is that only lawyers can provide legal services, or our knowledge management model, which is go to the library or ask the gray haired senior partner. And finally, don't let me off the hook, our educational model, which is years of formal education, learning how to think, roughly speaking, like an 18th century common law lawyer. I'm not saying all those things are gonna go away completely, but nobody thinks that the world of law is going to look going forward the way it's looked in the past. And the current crises is only gonna accentuate these pressures. But, and this is very important, the old normal has not, nor should it be, revealed. Law for the foreseeable future remains a human capital business. Maybe there'll be, there certainly will be AI, there'll certainly be machine learning, but for the foreseeable future, law will be delivered by human beings, which means that those human beings are our greatest asset and they need to be recruited, developed, and managed. Clients still want a relationship with lawyers, particularly for important work. And this is reinforcing something that many on this call know about, which is a kind of partnering model with their key legal service providers. And this is critically important. Tradition and stability continue to have important value for both lawyers and clients. Look, there's a reason why we call it the rule of law. That is, they, we want stability, we want predictability in important institutions and in important rights. If we're not going to fully deregulate the ride hailing business, as Uber has found out, we are certainly not, nor should we, fully deregulate the legal business. And 
we have to remember that we are asking both people and institutions to make long-term investments that are difficult to change. So there's a paradox here. And as Timothy already noted, generational change is just going to accentuate that paradox. So he already said millennials and Gen Zs, already 38% of the workforce, they're gonna be 58% by 2030. And we know that they are born digital as my colleague, John Palfrey, now the head of the MacArthur Foundation wrote way back in 2008. But we also know that they are increasingly seeking meaning and purpose in their lives. And the pandemic of the protests will only heighten these dual commitments. And this is critical for us in the legal profession where recruitment and retention depends upon legitimacy, right? As the legal profession faces increasing disruption and increasing uh, competition, we need to have legitimately the idea of law as a fundamentally public profession to ensure our long-term survival. But to demonstrate that legitimacy, we've got to address our own house. And that's particularly true in countries like the US and the UK, which are rapidly becoming majority minority societies. So that means we need to be honest about our past. So there's a great study of Wall Street lawyers that I often quote by a guy named Erwin Smeagol. And this is what he said merit was in the mid 1960s in Wall Street. Wall Street law firms recruit men who are Nordic, <coughs> pleasing personalities and clean cut appearances, graduates of the right schools, have the right social backgrounds and experience in the affairs of the world and are endowed with tremendous stamina. Now, the good news is that meritocracy is not fully in effect anymore because no offense to, uh, there's not enough clean cut Nordic guys to go around. But the legitimacy or the legacy of that understanding is still very much still with us. And we could tell because there's a lot of work to do. So in 1996, I published the first major study on any, in any major publication uh, called Why Are There So Few Black Lawyers in Corporate Law Firms and Institutional Analysis. And the idea was that 40 years after Brown versus Board of Education, black lawyers still only made up 2% of the associates and less than 1% of the partners in top law firms. Lots changed since 1996, including the election of our country's first black president. But after rising slowly for a decade, Black associates are actually falling uh, since 2009 from 4.6 to 3.9 percent. And in 2019, let us just say this, seven major law firms had zero black equity partners and 20 of the top 100 have had only one. Unless you think it's better for Asians or Latinx, those numbers have risen only slightly. And unless you think it's better for women, Women still constitute around 20% of equity partners in most firms, even though they've been more than 40% of entering associates for more than, um, for almost 40 years. No one should be satisfied with these numbers. And you know what? Our clients are not. My former student, Kim Rivera, in 2017, issued a her, what I like to call, I'm mad as hell and I'm not taking it anymore letter. And when she said, unless you meet diversity goals, you forfeit 10% of your fees. 2019, 170 general counsel signed a letter saying, we as a group will direct our substantial outside counsel spend to those law firms that manifest results with respect to diversity and inclusion. 2019, advanced law, a network of 250 general counsels, the chair performance data said, we are going to build relationships between rising diverse law firm associates and chief legal officers and other senior in-house lawyers. And in 2019, Diversity Lab launched the Move the Needle campaign in which 25 GCs and five law firms put up $5 million to, quote, test innovative initiatives to create a more diverse and inclusive legal profession. These things are only going to be shoved ahead to turbocharge by the kinds of changes that Timothy talked about. And law firms, to their credit, are responding. 
We did a little uh, back of the envelope stuff. We looked at a NALP study across 250 law firms, 99% reported implementing at least one anti-racism or diversity, equity, and inclusion effort. Uh, most of these were around making statements, 76%, increasing pro bono, 69%, anti-bias training. Um, and uh, about 200 US firms have joined the law firm anti-racism uh, anti alliance to leverage resources of the private bar to fight racial justice. And we've seen similar initiatives in the UK, uh, including the Race Fairness Commitment Pledge, of which I'm proud to say for my brother that uh, Freshfields was one of the first signers. But it's gonna take more than words. Let's just be blunt. Uh, as the subtitle of my article said 25 years ago, this is an institutional problem. And that will require law firms to actually make changes, legal departments too, and the way they hire, develop, and retain lawyers. And the recent focus on the structural problems around COVID and around institutional racism have only shined a brighter light on this point. So here's the question. Who's gonna rise to the challenge, right? There's no guarantee. I'm a lot older than my younger brother, you can probably tell, uh, but my I've seen interest in diversity wax and wane over the course of my 35 plus years in teaching been down this road before. But I also agree with Tim that the forces are particularly in, uh, urgent now. COVID has underscored, as he so eloquently said, the interdependence and the fragility of our societies. And both the pandemic and the protests make clear that this interdependence and fragility is fundamentally connected to issues of race and social justice. And our clients, Companies are looking for lawyers, both internally and externally, who understand the critical link between sustainability, social justice, and success, and who are building it in their own institution. And here's the thing about this generation, like the Great Depression, which formed our parents' generation, everyone that has lived through this reality will be forever changed by it. There's no question in my mind. The lawyers who recognize this new reality will stand the best chance of attracting the best clients and the best talent. So here's our choice. And this is true for the legal profession, it's true for the clients we serve. There's two ways to react to a crisis. One is to retreat into the ways you know what you're doing, to go back into your shell, to retrench in comfortable and established ways. The other, to build and expand and meet the challenges of this new. And anyone who studies history knows this. Fortune favors the bold. Tim. Thank you, David. That is a great question. Um, and there are some best practices out there. I'm gonna just speak for about 10 minutes, David. The hope is then we will have a chance to move into a discussion. And for those of you who are starting to have lots of questions already kicked up, please do add them into uh, the question section and uh, we will have a long time for question and answer because I think there are so many issues that we want to address. So I'm just going back to sharing my screen and talk a little bit as David has described on, let me just make sure I can get over to that. What does it mean to be bold? Well, the first thing we know to be bold is that old diversity playbook. We looked, David, those numbers, um, on how little progress has been made were stunning. It shows that the old playbook has not been working. And I've got a picture here of Darren Walker, president of the Ford Foundation, where I took the phrase from throwing out the old playbook and I'll just quote him. He said, my advice to CEOs is to throw out the old playbook. More is going to be demanded of corporations and more should be demanded 
because they have a tremendous influence on how we live our lives. And so when I think about how the new playbook could look, I like to think about it as the four Ps, the power of the purse, the power of the pulpit, power of people, and power of practice. So let me discuss each of those. So the purse we've seen. We've seen these enormous amounts of money uh, being donated, but how can that purse be moved to actually building wealth and equity that can last in the black community, that can last in other communities of color and be a generational wealth creator? So donations will not do it. It has to be new initiatives. And we've seen these type of new initiatives, over a billion dollars worth of new initiatives. Of course, more is gonna be needed. But we see things like Bank of America making that billion dollar pledge over four years for communities of color. SoftBank, a really creative venture capital firm said, hey, we're gonna set up a hundred million dollar fund um, targeted just to minority-owned businesses, and that fund itself will be led by a person of color. Um, PepsiCo also has very creative initiatives out there, $400 million plus over the next five years, actually investing in black communities. So the purse is gonna make a difference. But then there's the power of the pulpit. And David, I couldn't resist but show a picture of our grandfather, the reverend, the right reverend Samuel Sweeney, who had a church at St. Mark's Methodist Church in Harlem. And he was certainly well known for persuading people to do the right and the righteous thing. But he also was well known for saying that he loved to have a silent collection that is, he didn't want to hear coins dropping into the collection plate. Those ought to be just bills. And the money is going to be mattering as we talk about persuasion. And if you look at the power of the pulpit for corporate America, it's in their advertising and marketing budgets and also their Twitter platforms. And what we saw after the tragic killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor was an enormous uptick in using those platforms that reach millions, billions of people around the world to promote racial justice and equality. And then you can take that a step further. It's not just the talk. It's actually making sure that those diverse voices can be put on your platform. So we saw P&G, for example, working with Queen Latifah, I love this, to create a platform for black filmmakers and other people of color who are directors trying to get their stories told. Um, but it's also about restricting the negative voices. And so we saw Snapchat say very clearly that they were going to shut down those voices um, that were trying to incite racial violence and had a negative impact. So the pulpit has a, a big influence. And then there's the power of the people. And yes, I have to, I had a picture of my colleagues from the London office. Um, the people will make a difference in terms of how you're going to move forward on really creating a new social justice and racial equality. And I think that it's gonna come down to thinking again about setting targets for the hiring, promoting of people into positions of power and authority. So it's not just the total number of new recruits, um, which at the moment in law firms, David, uh, as you mentioned on the gender side, is probably 50-50, if not even more women coming into law firms. But somehow or another, they're not coming up all the way through the organization. And that is true for people of color as well. Um, and there's going to take some bold leadership type of decisions. So where you actually have more people of color on boards and in senior management. And the only way that that's going to work throughout the whole organization is that organization itself has what I call a radically inclusive environment where people can bring their true selves to work. And here just briefly, there is a number of great best practices all the way along the people chain from looking at how to get younger people in their internship programs to making quantifiable targets. 
And I think that's going to be the key is something that we can come back and measure on of how these corporations are going to succeed. Power of practice. So the practice area, this is actually a, a new one, I think, um, because it's basically saying, how can we look at the way companies actually do their operations um, and what influence that has positively and negatively on communities of color? And I had to uh, note this Time magazine cover from the editor-in-chief of British Vogue, Edward Enenfull, who has just has done this amazing job of changing the dialogue so it's no longer just about having a few black models to show that you know we did not exclude black people from the fashion industry, but actually upending the concept of how we think about what is fashionable, who are the people that represent you know, what we'd like to see from a clothing point of view, but also a, a vision point of view of what body types are appropriate to show in fashion. And what happened is once he took the lead on that, other businesses realized this was an amazing business strategy such that you actually now have um, a new market that is expanded and more inclusive. And so when I look at some of these best practices on the positive side, again, you'll see people like JP Morgan investing in some of these best practices of how they're actually doing their lending process, making sure that it is more fair and equitable. You have the targets of the world getting out and committing to putting the time into their communities through pro bono hours and work um, for black and people of color. You have um, even the Walgreens and healthcare company that had previously locked up black hair products, for example, that you had to go and get somebody behind the register to help um, get your product to say, hold on, why are we assuming that a, a person of color is more likely to steal that to completely changing their model? And very clearly, that even some of these well-tread brands that everybody felt um, they knew well, like Aunt Jemima Syrup, if you think about how they echo stereotypes dating all the way back to slavery, that's not a business model that is going to be inclusive. And as David, as you said, that new generation of buyers that's coming out there, they absolutely will not be supporting it anymore. And my favorite, of course, was NASCAR, um, the large stock uh, uh, car um, races. They have said it's quite clear that you can't show the Confederate flag anymore at their rallies um, and at their events because that is not creating an inclusive environment. So I'm going to stop sharing. Oh, I'm, yep, yeah, I'm going to stop sharing there and uh, bring David back up. And what we'll do is we'll just, you know, chat for 15 minutes or so, David, and then we can bring in some of the questions from the audience. Uh, David, you know, I've mentioned the four Ps, but I have to say I am still a bit cautionary about whether even with some of these best practices, this could potentially just be a fad. And I'd love to hear some of your thoughts about why we think this could possibly stick. What do you think? So, Tim, you're right to be uh, cautious. And I think it's very important that people be cautious because everybody has assumed that we are going to solve this problem. Uh, and But uh, again, I'm a lot older than you. That's what people have been assuming uh, for a long time. And frankly, if we were gonna solve it with good intentions, we would have solved it a long time ago because we've had a lot of good intentions. But here's the problem. As I said, it's an institutional or structural set of problems. And the problem, as you have pointed out, is that people have tried to attack this the same way as they have before, which is kind of with initiatives around the edges, doing something here and there. But you know, as Einstein taught us a long time ago, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. That's the challenge. Here's why I'm hopeful. 
Uh, I'm hopeful because if you look at all those initiatives you put up on your screen, behind almost every one of them is a senior person of color in a position of authority. Why? It's not enough. We have a long way more to go. But on this dimension of real power and leadership, we are way ahead of where we were before. Why? This is the dividend of 50 years of uh, inclusion and diversity in our elite educational institutions, which primarily produce the leaders in corporate America, the legal profession, and in the rest of society. And some of those amazing women and men are now in positions of authority, and they are basically saying, we are going to use that platform mm. to make sure that this isn't just rhetoric. That's why there are billions and billions of dollars connected. And they now have allies uh, among the traditional you know, men who typically run these organizations, and they are saying to those allies, you said you cared about this, prove it. And that, I think, is a very important moment. When you add it to the other big trends, which we're already putting in destabilizing traditional ways of doing things, there's an opening for change. But that opening is only an opening, Tim. And I, what I want to ask you <laughs> is, what can law firms and companies do to make sure that they walk through that opening and to make sure that this is sustainable change? Yeah, David, you've set it up exactly right. And I would say we have to have it be part of our core practice area. And as Edward said, now I um, am looking over our global sustainability practice. And in the global sustainability practice, we are seeing how each of these elements that we're trying to make advances on are actually part of core strategies that business needs to be successful. And so examples of that, I'll just give four examples of different practice areas where you can see a real sophistication that law firms could bring in advising clients, but will have enormous impact um, on this issue of social justice. So first of all, sustainable finance, as you said, follow the money in some ways. We talked about green bonds, but there are other sustainable finance instruments, like there's something called a sustainability linked loan, where bankers are saying, we're gonna change the interest rate up or down based on you hitting a contractually agreed set of targets that we're looking around sustainability. And a good number of those targets have been around carbon, uh, decreasing their carbon footprint. But as we've seen, corporations now have quantifiable and measurements that they're going to use for improving their diversity statistics. So you could see sustainability linked loans in that front. Um, another area, and I do think this is critical, is the advice we're giving on the supply chain. So thinking about building that transferable wealth and equity of smaller businesses, black owned businesses or minority owned businesses, there's contractual work that you're doing there, but you also have a way to advise them on how they can make sure that supply chain is going to be reliable. So we just had a New York Circular City event where we realized how actually creating a collection and impact working between business, law firms, and government on effective localized supply chains can actually then decrease inequality because now you're relying more on the full business circle of the local communities. And just two last ones, um, antitrust is gonna be interesting. So one wouldn't think necessarily around racial justice that antitrust is an issue that pops up immediately. But the truth is that to work on these large challenges, David, it's gonna require collaboration. 
And collaboration means companies coming together and sharing information, which the antitrust authorities are usually not super crazy about. But through collaboration um, on, we're seeing it certainly around climate change and I believe also around racial justice, if we can advise on how to work on what is really in the best of a public consumer need, that can have a huge effect. And then the last one, of course, is corporate governance. We've seen already that corporations need to think about who's on their board of directors, but also the transparency. So how a law firm can help advise being transparent about what the numbers, how they can be successful, I think that that is really going to make the bigger difference. But sort of that comes more, again, David, to this issue of institutional constraints. You know, what ways can law firms be constrained as we start thinking about implementing this type of advisory work, which we think would be so powerful of a change? Well, I, I think, again, it goes back, Tim, to, to something that I said earlier about just the inherent conservatism of the legal profession. And uh, that conservatism has served us well. This is partly why I want to say that not everything should be disrupted but it also makes it difficult for us to think about our own institutions and how they operate and how they might operate differently um, and how we might measure the progress on how they might operate differently. So <clears throat> I'll just kind of say three big buckets and then I think I'm very interested in kind of hearing from uh, what our audience has to say about all of this. So, the first thing to recognize is that the market constraints on legal actors have gotten much more severe and the market has changed in very important ways. So you had a slide up there that said, we need to think about hiring and development and promotion. Great, except we need to recognize that hiring in the law firm world has moved from a primarily entry level hiring where we actually have metrics we could look at and there's a directory that is published and people monitor it to lateral hiring where there's much less monitoring, much less review or and transparency and much more built on traditional relationships and understanding about who's likely to bring value. All of which are going to make achieving diversity goals harder. And I think that's part of what we've been seeing. Or think about kind of retention and promotion. Uh, again, it used to be that people had a long time to try to learn how what it meant to become a good lawyer in a place like Freshfields, right? You never got a real serious review until your sixth year or something like that. <laughs> now, people are being reviewed and asked to leave in their first year. And as the economy tightens its screws, we know that last hired, first fired is one of those things that is a constant worry on diversity. And we have statistics in a book I wrote, uh, co-edited called Diversity in Practice, of which we showed in the, uh, in the 2008 recession, not surprisingly, the people who fared worse were uh, uh, lawyers of color and, and women, and particularly women of color. And then if you think about what it means to be a partner, it used to be, I, I used to say partner was like being tenured at a place like Harvard, which, uh, you know, tenure means never having to say you're sorry, which many of my colleagues unfortunately take literally. Uh, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, is that partner has gone from tenure to tenuous. And every partner in uh, the world fears that knock on the door. And that means it's all about short-term bottom line revenue generation. And we know that those metrics can be unfair to people who have less access to longstanding client relationships, et cetera. So there's a lot out there that's going to make this difficult. Okay, how are we gonna address it? One, we're gonna to have to be honest about the way in which our institutions currently work and how that perpetuates uh, existing inequalities, even in the presence of good intentions. I'm saying not even not in the absence of intentional discrimination, but in the presence of good intentions to change. 
It means we have to then, too, be willing to look critically and openly about those practices and how we're going to change them in a way that produces what we actually say we want, which is a more open, inclusive, and meritocratic playing field. Nobody's talking about moving away from meritocracy. What we're talking about is moving away from the vestiges of what Erwin Smeagol reported as meritocracy in the 1960s. Three, in order to do that, it comes back to what you just said at the end, Tim. It's going to require collaboration of all of the relevant stakeholders, which is not just clients collaborating together. It's also clients and law firms and other providers collaborating and finally, don't let legal education and educational institutions off the hook. We have to do a better job of preparing lawyers for the challenges and the realities of the current moment and beyond. And that is rethinking the way in which we do legal education and law students. So I teach a course with Ben Heinemann called Challenges of a General Counsel which for the first time is going to introduce is introducing students to the way in which these lawyers encounter the kinds of problems that whether you're in an in-house legal department or an outside law firm you're going to have to learn how to connect with but it's also continuing the law firm the law school out into the profession so two quick things we've started a set i started more than 10 years ago a set of executive education courses including where i had edward as my student uh, leadership in law firms we need to do much more collaboration and training across the professional boundary and then we started about five years ago a digital magazine called the practice which you can find on our website which is trying to do what the Harvard Business Review or The Economist does for business, which is take these issues and put them in a way in which sophisticated lawyers and uh, practitioners can engage with the latest academic research and academics can engage with the best of learning of practice. That's a full team, full court effort. And that's not going to be easy. But the payoffs, as you just said, are bringing the best of our traditions to the best of the future in a way that we will have a better, more inclusive, more successful legal profession than we've ever had before. And David, ending on the future is the perfect way to transition to Q&A because we have one of our associates, Jillian Simons, who's going to pop up on screen and join us. Jillian is also uh, a graduate of our alma mater in the law school, so thanks for that, Jillian. Uh, Jillian's also spent time both in our London and New York office, and I'm hoping that she'll be able to give us uh, the type of questions to continue that dialogue around thinking about what can we really do to keep going for the future. So Jillian, hi and welcome. Thank you. Um, that was a great presentation. So many great learning points. And I just want to note that we have viewers from all over the world. So we have quite a diverse set of questions headed your way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, starting off with education, um, if you don't mind, I'd like to direct this question to David. Um, there's quite a few questions that came in saying, you know, for corporations or law firms that want to attract a diverse um, set of candidates or minority candidates in respect to recruitment. You know, what can be done from an education perspective to enhance the pipeline, which I know is, you know, a word that's tossed around quite often. So I'll say a couple of things. Uh, one, get involved with your local schools and your legal education providers. Uh, you know, you have a lot of clout. Uh, you know, in our system, you finance our law schools through your donations. And in other countries where it's more, more public model, you still create the jobs that, are, uh, that our graduates go to. And if you say you want something and you actually need your voice heard, which means you have to be engaged, you have to not just make demands, but offer 
help in terms of uh, recruiting and outreach, uh, I think you have an enormous amount of power. That's the first thing. The second thing is make more of your uh, women and minority uh, lawyers successful. Nothing attracts us like success. And if people see other people like that being successful, they're going to think this is an opportunity that I might uh, be able to take advantage of. And third, broaden the scope of where you look. Everybody says to me, oh, there's just not enough black students at Harvard. We wish we could recruit black students at Harvard. Okay, well, black students at Harvard do pretty well in the recruiting market. But there are a lot of black students who don't go to Harvard and who have a lot of talent. And where people say, well, we can't lower our standards, I just remind them that given the competition to get in law school today, that if you went to Harvard in the 1970s or 80s and you applied today, you probably wouldn't get it. So let's just start there, right? And we also know that great lawyers are made, not born. That's why we call it the practice of law which means you can, I mean, obviously people have to have certain kinds of intelligence, blah, 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 but they also have to have a wide range of other skills like cultural leadership, like grit, that we don't measure in law school grades and admissions criteria, look for those people become great lawyers and then help them to do so and the pipeline will improve. Yeah, David, I just want to add briefly to that, Jillian, that is such a great point in terms of how practitioners should get out into the schools. And I teach adjunct at uh, Hunter College, where our mother actually went. But even at the undergraduate level, by getting out and teaching, you can find superstars that are on their way to move through. And at Freshfields, we even have a legal outreach program that starts with high school freshmen, getting them excited about these programs, learning the law. And as David said, if we say that that's important, we put our resources to do that, we're going to find that pipeline filling up. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and, and I'd like to stay on the topic of employees retention and, in, and recruitment. So we had actually two questions come in. I think people have been following the news. Um, and Tim, you specifically mentioned Microsoft and Wells Fargo. You know, they've announced various initiatives to increase the diversity of their employee and leadership populations. And now the U.S. Department of Labor, you know, they requested their plans. They're doing some level of investigation. Um, what do you think um, should be the next steps for companies who might be a little bit more timid to share their diversity plans um, as they risk potentially being investigated or questioned by the government? Yeah, this is, of course, why it's fantastic to have your lawyers right with you as you develop and create these plans. Similar to other disclosure issues, understanding appropriate measures about how to disclose, but let's be honest, we're moving towards a transparent world right now. We know that that information is going to be out there and it's going to be researched and investigated by potential employees, as David is describing. Um, but also the investors are asking about this. As I had mentioned, Larry Fink and others are saying, we want to see what that plan is. So typically when we think about disclosure, we're usually using the expression of, does it rise to a level of materiality? And materiality goes into the formal annual report, but we've seen in the sustainability area that these sustainability reports, which talk about what you're doing around green causes, is also going to start being a way that companies can showcase what they're doing around issues of racial justice and equality. So I think, yes, words do matter. You may have investigations, but we're living in a transparent world. And if we really are trying to achieve new records and goals around these issues, then you're going to want to be transparent and hire a nice law firm to help you draft that statement on how to be transparent. Jillian, I'll just say fortune favors the bold. And uh, the fact of the matter is there go there's going to be pushback. And I think we need to be clear about that. And I think we need to be honest about it. 
And I think the most effective way against the pushback is one, to say, to say what we're doing now is not neutral. In fact, what we're doing now actually is reinforcing a set of structural inequalities and be clear about that and be clear about how that's happening. And two, that what we're trying to move to is what we all want, which is a more open and meritocratic society and in which we're looking for the kind of talent that will allow us to succeed in the marketplace and to build a better society. So it can never be that this is what's wrong with the old play the playbook, Tim, is that diversity was a separate thing on the side. So we yeah. had our business and then we did diversity on the side. Well, then it's always going to be secondary and it's always going to be possible to put it in opposition to the goals of what we're doing in our main business. But in fact, that's just completely false. That what we need to think about is it's actually integral to our ability to succeed in the marketplace as it is now and as it will be developing in the future. And therefore, we as an organization, as a company, as a law firm, as a whatever, have not just a right, but a duty to try to yeah. build the kind of workforce that will allow us to succeed in this new world. Thank you, uh, David. I, I think that's um, a great lead into one of our other most popular questions, which is about the new role of the chief diversity or chief diversity and inclusion officer, um, which there certainly has been an increase of in both firms as well as corporations. So do you think that there's been any empirical evidence that's shown that they can have a positive impact, not just on building a diverse and inclusive workforce, but also, you know, where the firm or their corporation is spending their dollars is as far as procurement, contracts that they may have for services, um, the types of clients that they're willing to take on, or, or consumers that they'd like to attract? So it's a great question. And, it, uh, you know, Jillian, you know that uh, the Center for the Legal Profession is, is basically an academic research organization, and we have a research project on this exact uh, issue. And we actually started it about a year or so ago, we have a survey out in the uh, uh, of chief diversity officers, and we're trying to understand the, the possibilities and the challenges. And I'll just point you to two existing pieces of research and then say a little bit about what we're finding. So the first existing piece of research is by a terrific uh, sociologist named Frank Dobbin, who look, he's at Harvard, uh, not that we only cite Harvard people, but we're <laughs> proud of ourselves. Uh, and Frank did a, has written a series of articles on a huge empirical research looking at what moves the needle on diversity among different kinds of corporate initiatives. And one of the things that he found is the single most important thing you can do is put somebody in charge. Now, that's true of almost anything in corporate America. If it's everybody's responsibility, here's the problem. It's nobody's responsibility or nobody has, is held accountable for it. So you need to have somebody in charge. That's the first point. Here's the second point. But that person has to be supported, has to have the right kinds of credibility in the organization, the right kinds of credentials, and the right kinds of institutional support. So you may have seen, and some of your readers may have seen, Russell Reynolds, you know, the big uh, HR firm, wrote a, that one of their chief diversity person wrote a piece of uh, about 18 months ago called uh, Why Diversity Officers Are Set Up to Fail. And the argument was that they're given this title, but then they're not given any of the authority and any of the resources uh, that they need to actually drive the change. That's worse than not having somebody in charge because that pretends that you've done something when in fact you have. So the challenge is, and what we're trying to understand in our survey project, did anybody out there in cyber land who wants to be a part of it, uh, get in touch with the center on the legal profession or me, um, is to try to look at what resources are people being given? What are the problems they're being asked to look at? 
what are the uh, institutional uh, priorities that they are setting? Uh, what are their own background and credentials and how does that uh, affect how their ability to be able to drive change? So there's a, again, this is both the old playbook, but updating it. So, you know, we've had chief diversity officers going back to the 1970s. Um, and, you know, they have done lots of things, but they haven't solved the problem, but that's partly because they haven't been given the support that they need in order to do so. That's the new play. And what I like about that, David, is this group of new public statements that came out over the summer, those chief diversity officers were involved, of course, in drafting each of those statements. But the question is, can those chief diversity officers move into the business advising of achieving those lofty goals when we're talking about building true wealth and equity, um, using your platform to promote diverse voices. And so it'll be really interesting to see your research unfold as it's coming now, because we've already seen it in the sustainability space where chief sustainability officers are in the C-suite almost, you know, quite CFO, CEOs, but they're sitting there advising them because, and I love the point that you'd made earlier, that this is part of their core strategy now. And as you said, if they're really trying to improve and create a better world with the community pressures and all the other pressures, they need those people as part of core strategy. So just one more quick thing. It's great to have a chief diversity officer, but the chief diversity officer, in fact, has to be the CEO or the managing partner. That's good way to put it. Change has to be driven from the top. Everybody's going to know. So the, one of the questions we ask is, who do you report to? What meetings do you get to attend? All of the things that Tim said. And if people want those officers to succeed, people need to know that when they're speaking, they are speaking for the managing partner or the CEO. Thank you, David. Um, I'd like to pivot back to Tim um, and focus on a point where you talked about, you know, the business case, you know, for why we're doing this and the community pressures that are that companies are facing from the outside coming in. And since you are our global sustainability officer, I'd like to to throw you one of our questions from our UK participants. Um, they noted that the UK government's review of race in the workplace um, ended with a recommendation that there be some type of public policy on procurement so that companies, private companies and law firms will have to do business and use suppliers um, that are from a, a more diverse uh, group. And so they wanted to know what level of success have you seen either here in the US where there are public policies or investor pressure or community pressures or anywhere else in the world for that matter? Sure, thank you, UK. Um, you're a bit ahead of us here in the US on this and especially at the federal level. I think these type of regulations we're going to see coming. Um, but it's interesting, the U.S. model, which has been the most successful, has been around that investor pressure, that investors will say, look, we need to see these type of procurement policies in place. We need to see a certain percentage of other businesses being um, part of what you do to bring your product to market, not only because, as we we're saying we like to see it from a social justice point of view, but it's so much more stable. These procurement long lines that go back into other countries have been unstable. But I will say on the encouraging side here in the US, on the local level, there are quite a few of those procurement policies. So the New York City Circular City Initiative that we just um, discussed earlier, they have um, as part of that uh, policy that could we get the billions of dollars that New York City spends on procurement to increase the percentage of minority women and black owned businesses. So on a local basis, government driven, that's something that's been put in place. I think on the national level, it's still gonna be difficult in the US, um, but different local pockets is going to be important. 
And I think the continual pressure from investors and consumers saying this is what they want is going to lead to better results that way. Thank you, Tim. Um, keeping up with the theme of pressure, um, David, a question did come in for you. What do you think the role of um, the academic community as well as the judiciary community, that was also thrown in there, what do you think their role should be um, and if they can have a role in applying pressure to see change happen? So Jillian, this is partly what I'm saying about the need for collaboration and partnership. I mean, I like to think of this as an ecosystem. Uh, and the ecosystem has lots of different parts of it, all of which are required for it to be healthy and functioning. And one part uh, is, of course, the academy, right? And the academy does two things, both of which are critically important. One is it produces new entrants, right? So it's the gateway for new lawyers. Uh, and that means that we have a lot of uh, opportunity and responsibility about how we train and develop those lawyers. But the second is we, roughly speaking, get paid to think about hard problems. And, you know, practitioners uh, get paid to solve particular problems. We get paid to sit back and think about hard problems. And therefore, we have an obligation to direct some of that you know, thought and attention and research towards the issues of the profession itself. And that's been a woeful failure, let's just be blunt, in the legal academy. Uh, until, you know, I'll take some credit for this, until we started the Center on the Legal Profession, there really wasn't a major academic uh, le uh, law school anywhere in the world that had a center that was focused uh, on trying to understand the problems of the profession. And, you know, in business school, bu business school academics study the profession all the time. Legal academics study the law. That's very important, but our students are going to become lawyers, mostly not Supreme Court justices, although some will, you know, or not legal academics, but they're going to become lawyers or clients and consumers of lawyers, and we're all going to be citizens who live in a world where what lawyers do is important. So um, I think the academy has a pivotal role to play. And if you talk about the judiciary, um, here in this country, the judiciary is ultimately the regulators of the legal profession. And a lot of what we need to think about is how do we need to think about the regulation of the legal profession in the 21st century in order to make the legal profession able to do the kinds of things that we need it to do? And that means engaging with the judiciary. Similarly, judges are critical. Uh, you know, They sit atop the dispute resolution system. And the dispute resolution system is also a hugely important thing where we need uh, collaboration among uh, lawyers and uh, the bench of the bar. And I'll just throw out one more research project where we have a big, my next big online le webinar uh, is on online courts. It's actually not the next one, it's the one after that. But anyway, uh, we're doing something on online courts. With, uh, and there, as we move to remote courts, which people said you couldn't do, and now the world has had to do because of the pandemic, we need close collaboration between the bench and the bar. And why is that relevant to diversity? Because huge amounts of issues that are relevant both to the communities, diverse communities, like what happens with housing eviction, what happens with government benefits, and also huge issues around the opportunities for diverse lawyers to be successful in these new remote court proceedings are going to have to be worked out collaboratively between the bench and the bar. So huge issues. And, and David, I like this idea of thinking about the collaboration and I see that we're actually coming close to the end of our time together. Jillian, thank you for all of those questions, but it's quite interesting that the speaking of being woefully um, not using a resource in the legal profession as we're doing a lot of thought leadership pieces 
and um, creating things that we think are most useful for our young practicing lawyers and also for our clients, the interaction back to the academy has been lacking. And so to have a webinar like this, where you have a practitioner and a professor to share that, because I can tell you, David, just by listening to you, and I get to listen to you all the time around the kitchen table, I'm still learning new things for our profession. So can't thank you enough for joining us for this. And just wondering if you have any final thoughts that you'd like to leave the group with. Well, thank you, Tim. And, and thank you, Jillian, for uh, a magnificent job of curating those questions. Um, we're very proud of you back at your alma mater. Come back and visit us when you can. Uh, listen, I, I just want to end here. Uh, this is a moment, okay? It's a, it's a moment. But this moment will pass. I promise you. And I mean, we all hope it will pass, right? We hope we'll get off lockdown. We'll hope that every day won't have protests in the streets. But the question is, what do we do when we go back to our offices, when we go back to our schools, when we go back to our homes. And it's very important to talk about big structural institutional change. But when we do our uh, exec ed classes, as Edward knows, we always end with your own personal agenda. So I want to ask everybody on this webinar, a thousand people, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? to drive diversity and inclusion in your own organization, in your own circle. If everybody on this webinar were to reach out to somebody who hasn't been getting the kind of opportunity that they might, and just give them a chance. We're not asking for welfare here. We're just asking to give people a chance. Volunteer for a program, work on a pro bono case, mentor a young associate, as a general counsel, reach out to somebody at your firm, not just for a number, but talk to the person, help the person. If each of us made that kind of investment ourselves, you know, the next time we're together, we'll be in a lot better shape. Thank you very much, David. A huge thank you again to all the teams that helped put this together. I've got a personal uh, agenda, David, that I'm taking forward. I promise you that. Um, and with our clients and with academia as partnership. Jillian, thank you for all of your help there. And for those of you seeking CLE credit, I believe that was broadcast the number that you can achieve that credit. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for spending your day with us. Thanks, David. Take See care. you soon, Tim. Hopefully in the same place one day. Looking forward to it. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.